The Neurobiology of Pain by Dr. Clifford Wolf. Hello, my name is Clifford Wolf, and I am director of the program in neurobiology at uh, Boston Children's Hospital. And I'm going to talk today about the neurobiological mechanisms that are responsible for the generation of pain and the implications of uh, these mechanisms for both the prevention and treatment of, of pain. Introduction. I think it's uh, reasonable to, to ask first the question, why do we experience the sensation of pain? What particular functional role does, does it have? And perhaps the best way to uh, answer that is to look at those patients who lack sensitivity to pain. And this occurs in uh, rare cases of mutations to particular genes which result in a congenital insensitivity to pain. One of the more recent such genes is a voltage-gated sodium channel called NAV1.7 and loss of function mutations in this channel result in, in individuals who experience no pain whatsoever. The consequences of this are, are really quite severe. These individuals uh, not only demonstrate a, a lack of, uh, of pain in response to noxious stimuli, but actually damage themselves uh, because they are unaware of the potentially damaging features of our environment. Uh, for example, we explore the world with our fingers, and if we are not aware that something is potentially uh, dangerous, uh, we, we may actually injure ourselves. Equally, when we eat, uh, part of the way we uh, detect whether food is too hot is by our pain mechanisms, and if we, do, if we lack this, we are at risk of, of scolding our, our, our mouths and our, our tongues, and indeed even chewing our, 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 our lips and, and tongues. So individuals who lack the sensitivity of pain typically have severe tissue injury, and indeed their life expectancy is reduced. So the protective qualities of pain are, are really essential as an early warning device to tell us about uh, impending danger in, in, the, uh, in the environment. And this, uh, this early warning device is mediated by a specialized sensory apparatus that is activated only by intense or, or potentially dam damaging stimuli, stimuli that we call noxious. And the sensory fibers that mediate this function are called nociceptors, which is another way of saying these are sensory neurons that respond only to noxious and not to innocuous stimuli. One of the big breakthroughs in our understandings of the mechanisms of pain have come from the recognition that the sensory neurons, the nociceptors that respond to noxious stimuli, have particular proteins called transducers, which encode features of the environment, particularly those uh, associated with intense or damaging stimuli, and convert these stimuli into electrical activity which activates these uh, nociceptor fibers and carries information to the central nervous system where it can elicit both the sensation of pain, which we call nociceptive pain, pain evoked by a noxious stimulus, as well as withdrawal responses. When we analyze the, the pathways that uh, are responsible for nociceptive pain, we need to appreciate that the actual sensory experience of pain itself occurs within the brain. This is where the conscious sensation uh, arises from um, activation of, of uh, several major cortical areas. And the flow of information uh, that, that leads to this conscious awareness goes through several levels of the nervous system, including subcortical thalamic regions, regions of the, of the brain stem, as well as a major processing within the spinal cord. And indeed, it is activity in the spinal cord, which is really the gateway to the, uh, the, the activation of those pathways that lead to the sensation of pain. And as we'll see later, changes in the function of the spinal cord can lead to both increases or decreases in our uh, sensitivity to pain. And uh, modulation, central modulation, is a major contributor to several uh, clinical uh, conditions associated with pain. But in the end, the, the, the big, the major driver of nociceptor pain is activation of the peripheral sensory neurons, uh, the nociceptors, and this occurs in response to noxious heat, intense cold, uh, me mechanical stimuli such as pinprick, as well as a variety of chemical irritants, 
which uh, produce typically a, a burning uh, a sensation. So this, this then is nociceptive pain, the pain that helps inform us about damage and helps us to avoid such damage. This uh, particular slide now just illustrates the, the way in which a peripheral stimulus acting on the nociceptors through the protein transducers results in the activation of nerve fibers which carry action potentials from the periphery to the central nervous system, eventually to those parts of the brain which lead to the conscious awareness of a noxious stimulus, that sensation, that unpleasant sensation that we feel as pain. The reason this sensation is unpleasant is because that, that is a big major driver of our learning to avoid such stimuli. So uh, part of the protective mechanism of pain is the immediate unpleasantness of a noxious stimulus, but also the fact that we then learn to avoid such stimuli in, in, in the future. And absence of the capacity to feel pain in, in patients with congenital insensitivity to pain results in them failing to learn this and damaging themselves repeatedly. Clinical pain syndromes. That it, nociceptive pain is a physiological pain. It's the pain that uh, uh, all of us experience in our daily lives. However, there are obviously many clinical pain syndromes. And a major feature of all of the pain syndromes is that instead of being activated only by noxious stimuli, in clinical pain situations, pain may ar arise spontaneously in the absence of any stimulus. So normally, in order to feel a, a, a pain, you need an intense stimulus, such as uh, touching something that is too hot. But in patients, the pain may arise in the absence of any detectable stimulus. So spontaneous pain is one of the major features of clinical pain syndromes. Another major feature is heightened sensitivity. Normally, to uh, feel a sensation of pain, we need to be exposed to an intense or damaging stimulus, a noxious stimulus, whereas in patients, a stimulus that would normally produce in us an innocuous sensation, such as light touch or pressure or movement of a joint, now is, uh, can be intensely painful in a patient. And a big feature mechanistically about uh, how pain is generated is to understand this transition from a high threshold pain which is nociceptive pain, to low threshold clinical pain syndromes because it is this hypersensitivity which is the feature that um, makes pain so difficult for our patients. We can further look at clinical pain syndromes as having several major subtypes. One subtype is inflammatory pain, the pain associated with tissue damage and inflammation. Another is neuropathic pain, which is the pain that occurs in the presence of damage to the nervous system itself. And this can be damage either to the peripheral or to the central nervous system. And then finally, we have a, a group that has only relatively recently been recognized. And these are patients who are not exposed to a noxious stimulus, so they do not have nociceptive pain. They have no tissue damage or inflammation, so they do not have inflammatory pain. And there is no detectable damage to the nervous system. And instead, these patients seem to have an abnormal functioning of the nervous system. And this is why we call this group of patients as having dysfunctional pain. What I will now do is go through some of the major features of these different clinical pain syndromes and highlight some of the mechanisms that have been identified as contributing to these particular kinds of pain. So to start off with, we'll discuss inflammatory pain, the pain that is associated with inflammation, for example, associated with a bacterial infection, or tissue damage, frank tissue damage, which could be post-surgical or post-trauma. And the feature here is that the peripheral inflammation activates uh, immune cells, which are both uh, recruited and activated, and these produce a, a variety of chemical signals, uh, inflammatory modulators, some of which are lipids, some are ions, and some are, uh, are proteins. And these act on nociceptors to change their function. And a major feature of the changes that occur are an alteration in the excitability of nociceptors such that their threshold is reduced. They can now be activated by less intense stimuli than, uh, than, the, the, than what occurs in, in normal non-inflamed tissue. So inflammatory pain um, is a consequence of 
changes in the sensitivity of uh, the nervous system, both the peripheral nervous system, uh, what we call peripheral sensitization, as well as changes that occur within the central nervous system, uh, what we call central sensitization. And I'll explain uh, a little later exactly what occurs and how these uh, changes manifest. The next kind of pain I wish to discuss is neuropathic pain, which as I've indicated earlier, is pain associated with damage to the nervous system itself. And the neural lesion result in pathological changes in the function of the nervous system. So this is a true disease state of the nervous system and is associated with particularly damage to peripheral nerves in the commonest form of neuropathic pain, but this can also occur after a stroke or a trauma such as spinal cord injury. And the feature here is that the abnormal nervous system now becomes the generator of, of the pain and I'll I'll illustrate some of the changes that occur in the nervous system to produce this kind of uh, uh, clinical pain syndrome. The last pain syndrome again is dysfunctional pain and one of the disease syndromes that uh, is associated with this is a musculoskeletal disorder called fibromyalgia which is associated with widespread tenderness and uh, these patients do not have uh, any detectable neural lesion, there is no inflammation, and we now recognize that abnormal central processing and abnormal amplification of signals is the primary driver of this form of, uh, of pain. In this situation, a light touch or a stimulus that most of us would feel is totally innocuous can now activate the nervous system, which because of its sensitized or amplified state, uh, results in the sensation of pain. Again, I will explain how mechanistically we have begun to understand the changes that are responsible for causing this sort of form of pain. What, one of the major forms of, of clinical pain syndromes that has recently been recognized is post-surgical chronic pain. Whenever a surgeon damages tissue, particularly if the surgeon damages the nervous system, they put the patient at risk of developing chronic post-surgical pain. And the degree of pain experienced depends on the degree of damage, as well as, in particular, whether nerves have been damaged as part of the surgical procedure. But we now appreciate that many patients, a minority, but still many patients, have severe disabling pain after surgical procedures. One of the features of this pain is we know exactly when the damaging stimulus occurs, and this provides us with an opportunity both to study the pain, in particularly the transition from acute to chronic pain, as well as offering us the uh, opportunity potentially to intervene and to prevent the, uh, the, this conversion to uh, chronicity. One of the key features of clinical pain uh, syndromes, as I've indicated, is heightened pain sensitivity. And uh, one of the best descriptions of this came from uh, the father of neurology in the, in the US, uh, uh, Weir Mitchell, who worked at Hopkins. And he described uh, a series of patients during the Civil War and one of his best descriptions about gunshot wounds that injured peripheral nerves was that of a patient who he described as, and I'll quote, as the pain increases, the face becomes anxious and has a look of weariness and suffering. The sleep is restless, the rattling of a newspaper, a breath of air give rise to increases of pain. So this is a very dramatic description of this heightened pain sensitivity where even a, a rattling of a newspaper or a breath of air is sufficient to produce severe pain in, in a, an afflicted patient. So I'm going to spend most of my time talking about neuropathic pain and I will try and convince you that this represents a disease state of the nervous system that is induced by damage to the nervous system. We have in the past tended to think of pain only as a symptom, as the expression of some other disease, of a wide range of conditions that happen to produce pain. What has happened recently, as we understand the mechanisms that operate to produce pain, that in the case of neuropathic pain, the pain itself is the disease, and it is a disease caused by changes that occur in, in the nervous system. As we begin to dissect out the mechanisms that produce pain, this has uh, important uh, uh, implications for our approach to patients with pain. First of all, uh, this is important from a diagnostic point of view, and secondly, uh, it is important from, from uh, uh, the point of view of, of, of choosing the best treatment for our patients.
Using neuropathic pain as our example, what I'd like to take you through is a new approach to what perhaps we could call the pain path, where we start with what causes pain. And in traditional approach to the pain, we emphasize the etiology, which may be trauma, a metabolic disease, an infection, a compression of a nerve. But increasingly, we now recognize that, in fact, three factors are the drivers of clinical pain states. These certainly are etiological factors, but they also are the genotype of our patients. Some patients are, have a greater susceptibility to developing pain than others. And also there are environmental factors which influence the way in which genotype and etiology act to produce the pain. And as we proceed along the pain path, we realize that these three factors actually produce pain by generating individual neuropathology in a patient and that the neuropathology may vary from patient to patient. And this is the critical feature because there is not a clear link between a single etiology and a particular neuropathological change. This can be individualized so that patients with diabetic neuropathy, for example, may have different neuropathological changes which produce their particular pain. The way we recognize pain in a patient is to measure the pain, and this is what we call the pain phenotype. This is a combination of the symptoms the patient expresses as well as the signs we can elicit by examining the patient. And these may include spontaneous pain, pain evoked by different stimuli, and as well as the other neurological findings we may find. Increasingly, we also have sophisticated tools to examine the pain in our patients, and these may be electrophysiological measurements as genotyping our patients, as well as the capacity now using uh, functional imaging to actually see changes in the activity of different parts of the brain that coincide or are associated with different pain conditions. The end of the pain path is the treatment that we choose for our patients. In the past, the treatment choices have been largely empirical. Based on our experience, we associate certain syndromes with certain treatment choices. I would like to try and convince you that the way forward to optimize treatment is to target the treatment at the individual neuropathology that is present in our patients. And I will illustrate this as we proceed in this talk. So the next slide illustrates the link then between etiology and neuropathic syndromes. And in the past, that was all we really discussed. Etiological factors that produce the pain in our patients and the defining the particular syndrome our patients had. What was really missing were these contributing factors such as genotype and environment, and even more so, the individual pathophysiological changes that occur in the peripheral and central nervous system that uh, are actually responsible for generating the pain that our patients complain of. Pain mechanisms. I've um, argued that the, the future of uh, pain medicine rests on um, understanding pain mechanisms, and that is the kind of work that I do in my laboratory. But the challenge for clinicians is to ask themselves how can they potentially identify those mechanisms that produce pain in their patients and then use that to select the most appropriate treatment for their patients. This slide just illustrates the basic organization of the sensory apparatus. We have primary sensory neurons which have cell bodies in the dorsal ganglion and these carry sensory information from the periphery to the spinal cord where there is active processing of this information and then transmission of this information to higher brain centers. This information is, in the spinal cord is actively regulated both at a local level as well as by descending inputs from the brain which can modulate both increasing or decreasing the transfer of information from the spinal cord to the brain. We have two clear sets of sensory fibers in the periphery, those with a high threshold, the nociceptors that are activated only by noxious stimuli and which produce nociceptive pain, and the low threshold fibers which normally produce only innocuous sensations. How do we, as clinicians, potentially identify mechanisms in our patients? The argument I'd like to present to you is that the best way we can do this at the moment is to use the pain phenotype, those combinations of signs and symptoms, that those constellation of features that our 
patients have as a guide to what the major underlying neurobiological processes are in our patients that are generating their pain. Because at present, the treatment of chronic pain is largely by trial and error. It involves making treatment choices without any identifying which patient is likely to respond better to a particular treatment or not. And in consequence, most of our patients are, do not benefit from our treatment. And we need to go through several cycles of treatment to try and find one that produces the greatest benefit. And I'm going to illustrate this by taking you through a, a series of scenarios illustrating how changes in the nervous system can produce particular uh, features, particular signs and symptoms. We'll start off in, in the case of neuropathic pain by looking at negative symptoms, the loss of some function. And in the case of damage to the peripheral nervous system, this could either be terminal atrophy, for example, in, in patients with diabetic neuropathy, as well as axonal degeneration, which may occur after trauma, invasion of a nerve by a tumor, or compression. In both of these cases, there's disruption of the continuity of the nerve fiber with its target, and consequently, there's a loss of sensitivity. So in the case of terminal atrophy in patients with peripheral uh, neuropathy, there may be an increase in the threshold to evoke a heat pain response. With external degeneration, the loss of sensitivity is generally more dramatic and it will depend on which sets of fibers are lost, but there may be a general loss of sensation. When we deal with pain though, obviously we are more interested in positive symptoms. The actual pain itself is a positive symptom. And so what I'd like to describe now are some of the positive symptoms that are characteristic of clinical pain states. And we'll start off by a particular positive symptom that results from the reduction in sensitivity of nociceptors. I indicated before that a nociceptor is normally specialized to respond only to intense stimuli, such as intense temperatures. It is this capacity which enables us to differentiate a stimulus that is pleasantly warm from one that is uncomfortably hot and that actually produces heat pain. Now, one of the features of clinical pain syndromes, both inflammatory pain and neuropathic pain, is that the sensitivity of these nociceptors may alter. And this is the consequence of changes in the transducer proteins that convert thermal stimuli into electrical activity. And one example of this is a channel called TRIPV1. And TRIPV1 is the channel that's activated by capsaicin, which is the pungent ingredient in chili peppers. And the reason that we find chilies hot when we eat a hot curry, for example, is that they act on the same sensory uh, channels that, pr that actually produce heat pain. Now, one of the features, as I've mentioned, of inflammatory and neuropathic pain is heightened pain sensitivity, what we call a peripheral sensitization. And this is a result of a decrease in the threshold for activating nociceptors as a result of a heightened sensitivity of these trip channels. Now, once we know the mechanism, which is peripheral sensitization produced as a result of a change in the function of trip channels, such as TRIP-V1, and we understand how this can present in our patients, for example, as a heat allodynia, where a normally warm stimulus is now experienced as being painful, we then have an insight into the mechanism in this patient that is producing their pain. And this can guide us as to the best treatment for our patient. For example, in this particular circumstance, a trip channel antagonist, a trip V1 antagonist, may be the way to reduce this heightened heat pain sensitivity. And this really is the thesis that I'm going to argue for the rest of the talk. By understanding the mechanisms and how they generate the pain phenotype, we can make the best selection about what is the most appropriate treatment to use in our patients. Ectopic activity. The next uh, mechanism I'd like to discuss is one that is particularly found in, 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 in neuropathic pain uh, associated with damage to, to the nervous system. And this is the phenomenon or the mechanism of ectopic activity. Normally, to activate a sensory fiber, you need a particular stimulus. It may be heat, cold, mechanical stimuli, or chemical stimuli. However, after damage to a peripheral nerve, there may be an abnormal accumulation of ion channels in the membrane of the damaged nerve such that the nerve has become hyperexcitable and there may be spontaneous depolarizations in this nerve that are sufficient to initiate action potentials. 
and the initiation of action potentials by a patch of nerve that is not in the periphery is what we call ectopic activity. So the action potentials are not being generated out in the peripheral tissue, in the skin, joints, or the viscera, but are being generated somewhere along the axon. And this generates a set of action potentials which enter the nervous system and which are interpreted as being a spontaneous pain. So ectopic activity is, is one of the major drivers for pain that occurs in the absence of any stimulus and is the consequence of an increase in excitability of damaged neurons resulting from accumulation of an abnormal accumulation of ion channels, changes in the properties of these ion channels such that there may be pacemaker-like potentials in the membrane generating action potential discharge. So again, if we look at uh, the link between mechanism, phenotype and treatment, in patients who have this abnormal excitability sufficient to generate activity in injured nerves, these action potentials will generate spontaneous bouts of pain. This is the phenotype we'll recognize. And if once we as clinicians identify that this patient is likely to have ectopic activity, we can then decide on a treatment that is targeted at that mechanism, for example, using a sodium channel blocker. Central sensitization. The next mechanism I'd like to discuss with you is, a, is an, another form of sensitization, but this is one that doesn't occur in the, peripheral, in the periphery or in the peripheral nervous system, but rather in the central nervous system, and is called central sensitization. And this is a, a series of changes that occur in the nervous system whereby sensory signals are amplified and the flow of information in certain pathways is facilitated abnormally such that stimuli which normally would produce an innocuous sensation now begin to activate those pathways that lead to the generation of pain. So that if we look at the division between pathways that produce pain and those that produce innocuous sensations, the big difference is that pain is generated by high threshold nociceptors and these feed in the spinal cord on a series of transmission neurons that lead to those parts of the brain that generate the sensation of pain. Whereas innocuous sensations are activated as a result of stimuli, low intensity stimuli that act on low threshold sensory neurons, which then feed through quite different series of pathways in the central nervous system to quite different parts of the, the cortex and lead to innocuous sensations. However, it turns out there is a link between the two that the sensory fibers that carry innocuous sensations do have a connection with the pain transmission neurons, but normally this link is so weak that it does not activate them and there's a clear separation between stimuli that produce pain and stimuli that produce innocuous sensations. Central sensitization is a change within the central nervous system such that the normally weak link, a link that is so weak that normally there is no interconnection between the innocuous pathway and the pain pathway, now that link is increased in strength, the synaptic connections are strengthened, the excitability of central neurons is increased, and that means that potentially innocuous sensations can now begin to activate the pain pathway. And this is the key feature of central sensitization inflow from primary afferents, from nociceptors, reaching into the spinal cord, release transmitters, which then act on postsynaptic neurons in the spinal cord to change their function. And this is the, the site of action of central sensitization. It is an activity-dependent change in synaptic strength, whereby inputs in nociceptors trigger prolonged changes in excitability, a kind of memory, if you like, uh, within the spinal cord, which produces uh, this heightened uh, 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 transmission, this facilitation of, of, uh, of, the, of, uh, of the flow of information and enables uh, normally innocuous uh, stimuli now to begin to produce uh, pain sensations. Um, if we look at mechanistically at, at what happens, there are a number of changes that are responsible. One is that there may be changes in the transmitters produced by injured or neurons that innervate inflamed tissues. They begin to produce more transmitters, so their central actions may be enhanced. There is also a change in the actual circuitry. Some, after nerve damage, 
Uh, some fibers can regrow from one position within the spinal cord to another, and they may begin to produce novel inputs. But the major driver of central sensitization is synaptic strengthening, and this involves the release of transmitters, activating many different kinds of postsynaptic receptors, and an increase in the synaptic strength, mediated both by post-translational changes, which are phosphorylation of, of receptors, increased trafficking of receptors from intracellular stores to the membrane, as well as transcriptional changes, which result in the expression of novel genes, which may change synaptic function. The cumulative effect, though, is to increase the strength of the synaptic transmission and produce a central amplification. The gain of the central nervous system, if you like, is increased. So again, if we come back to our way of analyzing how individual neuropathology can produce a particular pain feature and how this can help inform us about treatment, here we're dealing with central sensitization, which results in an increased flow of information from normally innocuous channels to the pain transmission pathways because of heightened synaptic transmission and increased central excitability. This will manifest in the patients typically as allodynia, whereby an innocuous sensation produces pain, and one of the major manifestations of central sensitization is mechanical allodynia, where light touch of the skin or light brush is now perceived as being painful. Once we recognize this, and this represents our clue as to the mechanism that is producing the pain, we can now treat the patient accordingly, for example, by giving drugs that reduce synaptic transmission, and pregabalin or Lyrica is, is one example of such a treatment. Disinhibition. Another mechanism, central mechanism, that uh, amplifies pain uh, activity is the loss of the normal inhibitory mechanisms that are present in the central nervous system. So if we look at the spinal cord, there's not only a flow of excitatory information from the periphery to spinal neurons and then uh, the transfer of this to the brain, there are also many inhibitory mechanisms which control this flow of information so that it does not spread too far and does not cause an overexcitation of the nervous system. Some of these inhibitory mechanisms are local, they are restricted to the spinal cord, and some reflect inputs, descending inhibitory inputs from the brain. And we now appreciate that in addition to an increase in excitation, which produces central sensitization, a loss of these inhibitory mechanisms can also contribute to uh, clinical pain states. These may result from a loss of local inhibitory interneuron activity as well as a reduction in descending input. And these can drive our treatment choices. And at the moment, this is uh, largely related to uh, research activities, trying to identify ways that we can mimic these inhibitory mechanisms. But indeed, some of the major treatments that we use for chronic pain conditions, such as uh, amine uptake inhibitors like duloxetine, act to boost the normal inhibitory mechanisms that operate from the brain on the spinal cord. So we need to learn to maximize these inhibitory mechanisms to suppress abnormal excitability within the central nervous system. Neuroimmune interactions. The final mechanism that I'd like to discuss is uh, one of the more recent that we've appreciated, which is that after both peripheral inflammation as well as inflammation to the central nervous system and uh, as a consequence of damage to the nervous system, there is a massive activation of immune cells, both at the site of the injury, but also within the central nervous system as a result of the activation of microglia, which are the immune cells of the central nervous system. The microglia have the capacity, similar to peripheral immune cells, to produce inflammatory mediators that can act on neurons and change their function. And we now recognize that at least in the early parts of neuropathic pain, soon after damage to the nervous system, that this microglial component is one of the drivers in the transition between an acute pain sensation and chronic pain. And again, this offers us with the potential of particular treatments, in this case immune suppression treatments, that may be suitable for aborting the transition of acute to chronic persistent pain. So I hope I've, I've given you uh, some insight into the way in which gene, uh, uh, etiological factors can act on the nervous system to produce a series of pathological changes. These include peripheral sensitization, ectopic excitability, central sensitization, loss of inhibitory mechanisms and recruitment of immune activity, 
which can then drive changes in the function of the nervous system which manifest in our patient as their pain phenotype and that this then can help us identify the predominant pain mechanisms and therefore the most suitable treatment. Pain phenotype and pain genotype. The way uh, this can be used is that instead of just asking our patient how if they have pain and how bad it is and where it is, we can attempt to pass out those key features of the pain that can uh, give us clues about mechanisms. And this has now been done experimentally in, in, in a number of, of, uh, of clinical trials whereby attempts are, are made to characterize in a more sophisticated way a fingerprint, if you like, of the pain that the patients are experiencing. And each one may be different, reflecting the combination of mechanisms, or in some cases, the single mechanism may be present. And it's certainly the early indications are that each personalized response histogram that can be generated may be an important clue as to exactly what is going on in our patient and what is the best form of treatment for that patient. I'd like to end up by uh, coming back to one of the uh, features that I discussed right at the, uh, the beginning. I said that pain uh, is initiated by three factors, by etiological factors, environmental factors, and pain genotype. And I'd just like to say a few words about pain genotype because this is an area that is of increasing interest and the subject of major research activity as we appreciate the way in which genetic variations, the normal variations that each of us have, may be a driver to the pain that we experience. And this uh, leads us to ask uh, these kinds of questions such as why does one individual feel more pain than another? as well as why does one individual transition to chronic pain and not another, even though both may have identical damage to their nervous system. What we appreciate now is by measuring pain in uh, large cohorts of both uh, human volunteers and in pain patients that there is a wide variation in pain sensitivity. Some patients genuinely do have much more pain than others, and the question, what is the driver of that? Um, in order to, to ask that, and, and in particular to focus on whether the, this, uh, uh, this range of, of pain sensitivity is driven by genetic factors, we can start by examining whether there are major pain phenotypes that are caused by genetic mutations. And the answer we now appreciate is most certainly yes. I've mentioned one of them earlier, which is a loss of function mutation in NAV 1.7, a sodium channel, causes congenital insensitivity to pain. I'd now like to describe another mutation in the same sodium channel, but these are mutations that cause gain of function. And this is a condition called erythromyalgia, which patients present with spontaneous burning pain, typically in the extremities, most commonly in their feet. Their feet look bright red. They describe them as the feet feeling as if boiling water has been poured on them. And in the inherited form of this condition, we now recognize that there are gain-of-function mutations in the sodium channel NAV1.7, which is expressed by nociceptors, and as a consequence, these nociceptors begin to fire spontaneously, producing this pain. These are very rare. These typically occur in something of the order of one in a hundred thousand individuals. So the question then is, are there genetic contributions that result to the variation in pain sensitivity that you or I may experience. In other words, are there common genetic polymorphisms or determinants of pain? And the way we can address that is to use a classic genetic approach, which is to see whether identical twins have a more similar pain sensitivity to non-identical twins. And we can do this in human twins as well as in inbred mouse strains. And what is fascinating is that when we study both these the model organism, the mouse, as well as humans, we find pretty much the same answer, which is that of the order, something of the order of 50% of the variation in pain sensitivity can be accounted for by uh, genetic factors. In other words, an identical twin who has a particular pain sensitivity, both twins are more likely to have a similar pain sensitivity than a non-identical twin. So what are the genes that pr produce this pain sensitivity? Well, we're at really at the beginning of exploring this, and uh, at, at the moment only a handful of genes have been identified that have polymorphisms in them, common polymorphisms, 
which uh, are associated with uh, changes in pain sensitivity. And these include uh, genes such as the mu opiate receptor and a number of ion channels and enzymes. Almost certainly we're going to recognize more. There may be some polymorphisms that are very rare that have relatively large effects, but it is more likely that there are many genes which have a very small effect, and it is the combination of polymorphisms in multiple genes which determine our own individual pain sensitivity. Summary. So to, to, to end up, what I've uh, attempted to do today is to introduce you to some of the mechanisms that produce pain, to show you how these mechanisms can produce uh, different pain phenotypes and how recognizing this pain phenotype and through it the likely mechanism we can make a more rational treatment choice for our patients. We can also through a combination of understanding pain mechanisms and recognizing the genetic determinants of pain begin to reach a point where we will in the near future be able to identify those patients who are at risk of the developing pain. In recognizing this, we may be able to begin to intervene to reduce uh, the, 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 uh, the, the development of chronic pain. So we will hopefully be able to develop pain susceptibility algorithms that are based both on the genotype of our patients, particularly environmental factors. What is literally just around the corner, the development of pain treatment predictive algorithms based on patient phenotype, where by looking at the patients carefully and identifying unique features of their pain phenotype, we are going to be in a position where we'll be able to decide what is the best treatment. In a more uh, mechanistic understanding of pain and using that to help drive treatment decisions, we should be able to target treatment in a much more effective way. Thank you. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.